I was 22 at the time and hadn't been out of university that long and I started getting symptoms of um, fatigue and I was always really hot and sweaty. As time went on I struggled more with blurred vision and dizzy spells. The fatigue was so bad that if I wanted to have a, a chat with somebody and have a cup of tea, then the rest of the day I'd, I'd just feel completely wiped out. You know, the kind of fatigue you have like when you have the flu. At one point they sent a physiotherapist to my house because I wasn't able to stand for very long and, and I was really uneasy on my feet. I, I didn't have very good balance and I was given a diagnosis of um, mental health illness. I was given a lot of anti-anxiety and antidepressants. Symptoms of anxiety are very similar to symptoms of polyembolism, and you can imagine the two get very mixed up and combined, and that makes it difficult to feel confident of your body that it's going to tell you when something's wrong. The day when I was taken into hospital, I was seeing people or shapes, and I thought, oh, I'm hallucinating. So I called for help, and then I must have had this collapse because I came to and there were two paramedics standing in my bedroom and I remember saying this isn't a dream because <laughs> it felt like like a nightmare in hospital they ran a lot of tests and I didn't know until a couple of years later that they they asked to phone my friends and family to say that they, they might need to come and say goodbye. I hadn't realised um, that it was that serious at that point. I was diagnosed with multiple pulmonary embolism. It did bring a lot of relief to have a diagnosis, to feel like we were getting somewhere and that I'd get better. Um, I thought that I'd take the medication and that would make me better and I had no real understanding of the, the journey I had ahead of me at the time. Pulmonary emboli can be difficult to diagnose because patients don't present in what the doctor has always thought was a classical way with chest pain uh, and sudden onset of shortness of breath. And this is particularly true, I think, with those who gradually get more short of breath over a long period of time. And when you're short of breath and when you're short of oxygen in your lungs, you can feel quite anxious because you're hypoxic, you're short of oxygen and it gives you those feelings of panic. So occasionally we see people who come through the psychiatrist who are very panicky and anxious. And actually they have pulmonary emboli as the cause of their anxiety. While skiing in France, I broke my leg and spent uh, four days in hospital in France um, having my leg uh, plated and pinned. Part of that treatment was to administer um, what they call low molecular weight heparin, which is an injection into the tummy. On arriving back in the UK, I visited a specialist to look at my leg and he decided it would be better to place it in a boot to immobilize it. Initially the symptoms weren't too severe and I felt that my leg was healing very well and asked the specialist whether it was necessary to carry on with the heparin and finding it uncomfortable to continually inject myself twice a day and he said no you're probably okay now. Maybe now realise that was perhaps a mistake. About two weeks after that, started developing pain within the leg, which progressively got worse over a period of three or four days. It reached a stage where, in fact, just getting out of uh, bed, putting my foot to the floor, was almost impossible. I visited the specialist who suggested that it might be a deep vein thrombosis and was sent to A&E where a diagnosis of a deep vein thrombosis um, was, was confirmed. I was prescribed rivaroxaban for my deep vein thrombosis. I took it religiously because if once you've had a DVT, there, there is always a risk of another one. When we look at all of the blood clots that can occur, in actual fact, over 50% 
are due to hospital admission and they can either occur in the hospital or more frequently after discharge and it's a consequence of the problem of being in hospital usually people are unwell so their blood is quite sticky or they might be very immobile in hospital and when you're lying and not doing much with your legs the muscles can't stimulate the blood flow in the legs lastly one can have operations on the tummy or on the legs that can damage the veins and that too is a risk factor so for the 90 days after being in hospital one is at increased risk of having a blood clot and a deep vein thrombosis might show itself up as unexplained pain in the leg or maybe even swelling and some change in color and of course that Deep vein thrombosis might cause a pulmonary embolism without causing any signs and symptoms of DVT. And pulmonary emboli can cause shortness of breath, chest pain, coughing up blood, feeling lightheaded. Any of those symptoms, you should urgently seek medical help. In December, I first started to feel unwell. I just wasn't feeling myself. I was more fatigued than normal. I used to go to the gym five, six, seven times a week. That was a big part of my life. It was a big part of my social life. It declined because I was becoming unwell. Went to A&E where they monitored my heart rate, had a chest X-ray and some blood tests, and they said, well, your heart rate is irregular, but we're not really sure why. Then I noticed the swelling in my calf. From there, I started to really notice the shortness of breath. And the kind of shortness of breath that I'm talking about is where you are actually huffing and puffing at the end of a task. I had started to bring up small amounts of blood. Actually, the symptoms that I was having at the time were very typical of a DVT and a pulmonary embolism. I had 18 different interactions and appointments with healthcare professionals and it wasn't until May that I was diagnosed and admitted to hospital. When I came back from the CT scan, they said both of your lungs are just full of clots. It was a feeling of relief that actually there was something wrong with me and it was being diagnosed. So pulmonary embolism is when some of the clot in the leg or in the pelvis breaks off, travels through the body and will go and block a pulmonary artery in, in the uh, lungs. And if you have a really big one, unfortunately, if it blocks all the blood supply, it, it can cause sudden death. Smaller ones cause different symptoms. So quite often people are a little bit short of breath suddenly, or they might have some chest pain or they might cough up some blood. Those are the classic symptoms. But many people might have a different set of symptoms. So because they're blocking the blood supply, they might feel quite light headed or even a little bit panicky because they're short of oxygen. If we find there's a pulmonary embolism, then the treatment must be anticoagulation. And anticoagulation can come either as a tablet, if it's a small one, or if it's a little bit worrying and it's a big one, uh, you might have heparin injections or actually a heparin infusion directly into the vein. Occasionally, we need to use clot busters if there's a lot of clot there. was taken off medication and to find the cause of my blood clots and it was then that they found that it was triggered by the combined contraceptive pill. When I was given the pill I didn't take much consideration into the illnesses that I could get. I think a lot of medications come with a long list of you could get <laughs> and I think it's quite normal just to, to ignore them unfortunately. For me um, I was one of the statistics. 
Just after diagnosis, I felt that I wouldn't want to do anything to up my risk of having another blood clot. I felt so strongly about the risk of my mortality that when I first started dating my partner, I wasn't sure to date him at all. I felt a fear that if, <laughs> if he started dating this girl and she died, how would that impact on his life? And then the risk of having a, a father and a baby without a mother, which to me is just the most heartbreaking thing. I suffer from survivor's guilt and it's the stories about the mums that don't survive that um, because my lungs were filled with these blood clots and I didn't even know and these ladies have the risk and they don't always know that they're at risk. The combined oral contraceptive pill is actually a risk factor for having DVT because it contains oestrogen and it's the oestrogen which makes blood sticky. And if you have a deep vein thrombosis or a pulmonary embolism on the pill, we wouldn't give the combined pill again, but there's lots of good options to use for contraception. So we have the progesterone only pill, which has no oestrogen in it, also known as the mini pill. And then we have the progesterone implant. And lastly, we have coils. And for women who have to take long-term anticoagulation, we particularly like the marina coil, which tends to reduce bleeding. had a fairly good recovery. Certainly the first nine months to a year of that was a, a gradual progression towards now relatively normal fitness. I play golf, I run, I walk. All of those things came to an abrupt end for quite some time and it's only now three years later that I've actually got back on skis again. My knowledge of deep vein thrombosis before it was actually diagnosed was uh, sketchy, to say the least. At no time was I told in the hospital that this was a risk factor. I was on rivaroxaban, which is an anticoagulant, um, for the next three months anyway, and I took it religiously, because if once you've had a DVT, there, there is always a risk of another one. So if I was to go back into hospital again, um, I would certainly be asking um, what the risks are of a repeated deep vein thrombosis. The problem of having, having had one before, um, should, should I have, take additional um, precautions? If a health professional thinks you might have a blood clot, they usually go through a scoring system called the Wells scoring system and do a blood test called a D-dimer. And if they confirm that you're at risk, then you will go through and have imaging done. And most cases it's ultrasound, Doppler ultrasound, and that will find uh, the clot in your vein 99% of the time. Once the diagnosis is made, then the treatment is anticoagulation. The anticoagulation is designed to stop the clot from growing. And usually these days we use new tablets called direct oral anticoagulants. You start them that day and they thin the blood straight away. We also can use heparin injections as well. And we have the old fashioned warfarin. And you can expect to be on anticoagulation for three months in the first instance, as most of clots are provoked, probably from hospital admission. We just continue for three months and we stop. But if it's unprovoked and we're not sure of your future risk of having another clot or you've got an underlying sticky blood condition, we might leave anticoagulation over the next few years.
we often read in papers about what happens to people with blood clots. They die and I feel people were dismissive of me and left me in at high risk. How many people are out there now that are facing those same risks? It's frightening. I think it has changed me as a person because you get this kind of hyper-anxiety about every single symptom that you have. If I get a pain in my arm, in my chest, all those kind of things, I begin to think, what's happening? What is this? What potentially could it be? Do I need to have a look on Google? I need to go to see my doctor, but I need to be quite prepared to challenge what they say to me. Even if they say, oh, we don't think it's anything to worry about, I can't leave that doctors and think, actually, yeah, it's nothing to worry about. The thing that really made a difference for me was actually my own research. I found Thrombosis UK. First thing that I did was I saw they were having a conference for patients, so I went along to it. There's other people that have similar stories and just being able to share that experience with people that can really empathise and understand what you've been through has made a massive difference. After people have a blood clot, it's not surprising that many feel anxious and even depressed. It's a natural response to the body being ill. Uh, and sometimes they have difficulties in trusting health professionals again. Uh, if you have that type of symptom, it's probably important to seek out help through the general practitioner who might have a counsellor or a clinical psychologist attached to the practice. For us at Thrombosis UK, we have a helpline uh, and people willing to talk to you if you would like. <laughs>